Heaven, or the heavens, is a common religious, cosmological, or transcendent place where beings such as gods, angels, spirits, saints, or venerated ancestors are said to originate, be enthroned, or live. According to the beliefs of some religions, heavenly beings can descend to earth or incarnate, and earthly beings can ascend to heaven in the afterlife, or in exceptional cases enter heaven alive. Heaven is often described as a «higher place», the holiest place, a paradise, in contrast to hell or the underworld or the «low places», and universally or conditionally accessible by earthly beings according to various standards of divinity, goodness, piety, faith, or other virtues or right beliefs or simply the will of God. Some believe in the possibility of a heaven on earth in a world to come. Another belief is in an axis mundi or world tree which connects the heavens, the terrestrial world, and the underworld. In Indian religions, heaven is considered as svarga loka, and the soul is again subjected to rebirth in different living forms according to its karma. This cycle can be broken after a soul achieves moksha or nirvana. Any place of existence, either of humans, souls or deities, outside the tangible world heaven, hell, or other, is referred to as otherworld. Etymology <inaudible> The modern English word heaven is derived from the earlier Middle English heaven attested 1159, this in turn was developed from the previous Old English form havon. By about 1000, havon was being used in reference to the Christianized, "...place where God dwells", but originally, it had signified, "...sky, firmament", e.g. in Beowulf, c. 725. The English term has cognates in the other Germanic languages, Old Saxon heen, sky, heaven, hence also Middle Low German heaven, sky, Old Icelandic hemin, Gothic himens, and those with a variant final L, Old Frisian himmel, himmel, sky, heaven, Old Saxon and Old High German himmel, Old Saxon and Middle Low German hemel, Old Dutch and Dutch hemel, and Modern German himmel. All of these have been derived from a reconstructed Proto-Germanic form asterisk hemina, or asterisk hemo, the further derivation of this form is uncertain. A connection to Proto-Indo-European asterisk chem, cover, shroud, via a reconstructed asterisk k, emin or asterisk k, omen, stone, heaven, has been proposed. Others endorse the derivation from a Proto-Indo-European root asterisk h ekmo, stone, and, possibly, heavenly vault", at the origin of this word, which then would have as cognates ancient Greek akmon, akmon anvil, pestle, meteorite, Persian asmon, asmon, asmon stone, sling stone, sky, heaven, and Sanskrit asmon, asmon stone, rock, sling stone, thunderbolt, the firmament. In the latter case English hammer would be another cognate to the word. Ancient Near East Topic: <inaudible> Mesopotamia The ancient Mesopotamians regarded the sky as a series of domes usually three, but sometimes seven covering the flat earth. Each dome was made of a different kind of precious stone. The lowest dome of heaven was made of jasper and was the home of the stars. The middle dome of heaven was made of sagilmet stone and was the abode of the Ijiji. The highest and outermost dome of heaven was made of Luludanitu stone and was personified as an, the god of the sky. The celestial bodies were equated with specific deities as well. The planet Venus was believed to be Inanna, the goddess of love, sex, and war. The sun was her brother Utu, the god of justice, and the moon was their father Nana. In ancient Near Eastern cultures in general and in Mesopotamia in particular, humans had little to no access to the divine realm. Heaven and earth were separated by their very nature. Humans could see and be affected by elements of the lower heaven, such as stars and storms, but ordinary mortals could not go to heaven because it was the abode of the gods alone. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh says to Enkidi, who can go up to heaven, my friend? Only the gods dwell with Shamash forever." 
Instead, after a person died, his or her soul went to Kerr, later known as Urkala, a dark shadowy underworld, located deep below the surface of the Earth. All souls went to the same afterlife, and a person's actions during life had no impact on how he would be treated in the world to come. Nonetheless, funerary evidence indicates that some people believed that Ananda had the power to bestow special favors upon her devotees in the afterlife. Despite the separation between heaven and earth, humans sought access to the gods through oracles and omens. The gods were believed to live in heaven, but also in their temples, which were seen as the channels of communication between earth and heaven, which allowed mortal access to the gods. The Ikur temple in Nippur was known as the Duren Ki, the mooring rope of heaven and earth. It was widely thought to have been built and established by Enlil himself. Canaanites and Phoenicians Almost nothing is known of Bronze Age pre BC Canaanite views of heaven, and the archaeological findings at Ugari destroyed c. 1200 BC have not provided information. The 1st century Greek author Philo of Byblos may preserve elements of Iron Age Phoenician religion in his Sanchunyathan. Topic: Hurrians and Hittites. The ancient Hittites believed that some deities lived in heaven, while others lived in remote places on earth, such as mountains, where humans had little access. In the Middle Hittite myths, heaven is the abode of the gods. In the Song of Kumabi, Alalu was king in heaven for nine years before giving birth to his son Anu. Anu was himself overthrown by his son Kumabi. Abrahamic religions <inaudible> Hebrew Bible As in ancient Near Eastern cultures, in the Hebrew Bible, the universe is commonly divided into two realms, heaven and earth Sometimes a third realm is added, either C". Exodus chapter 20 verse 11, Genesis chapter 1 verse 10, water under the earth. Exodus chapter 20 verse 4, Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 8, or sometimes a vague land of the dead that is never described in depth. Job chapter 26 verse 5, Psalm chapter 139 verse 8, Amos chapter 9 verse 2. The structure of heaven itself is never fully described in the Hebrew Bible, but the fact that the Hebrew word Samayim is plural has been interpreted by scholars as an indication that the ancient Israelites envisioned the heavens as having multiple layers, much like the ancient Mesopotamians. This reading is also supported by the use of the phrase, Heaven of Heavens. In verses such as Deuteronomy 10:14, 1 Kings chapter 8 verse 27, and 2 Chronicles chapter 2 verse 6 and 6:18, in line with the typical view of most Near Eastern cultures, the Hebrew Bible depicts heaven as a place that is inaccessible to humans. Although some prophets are occasionally granted temporary visionary access to heaven, such as in 1 Kings chapter 22 verses 19 to 23, Job chapter 1 verses 6 to 12 and 2 to 1 minus 6, and Isaiah chapter 6, they hear only God's deliberations concerning the earth and learn nothing of what heaven is like. There is almost no mention in the Hebrew Bible of heaven as a possible afterlife destination for human beings, who are instead described as resting. In Sheol, Genesis chapter 25 verses 7 to 9, Deuteronomy chapter 34 verses 6, 1 Kings chapter 2 verse 10. The only two possible exceptions to this are Enoch, who is described in Genesis chapter 5 verse 24 as having been taken by God, and the prophet Elijah, who is described in 2 Kings chapter 2 verse 11 as having ascended to heaven in a chariot of fire. According to Michael B. Hundley, the text in both of these instances is ambiguous regarding the significance of the actions being described, and in neither of these cases does the text explain what happened to the subject afterwards. The God of the Israelites is described as ruling both heaven and earth. Genesis chapter 14, verse 19, 22, 24 to 3; Psalm chapter 146, verse 6. Other passages, such as 1 Kings 8 verse 27 state that even the vastness of heaven cannot contain God's majesty. 
A number of passages throughout the Hebrew Bible indicate that heaven and earth will one day come to an end. Psalm chapter 102 verses 26 to 27, Isaiah chapter 13 verse 5, 1426, 2418, 51 to 6, Jeremiah chapter 4 verses 23 to 28, and Zephaniah chapter 1 verses 2 to 3 and 18. This view is paralleled in other ancient Near Eastern cultures, which also regarded heaven and earth as vulnerable and subject to dissolution. However, the Hebrew Bible differs from other ancient Near Eastern cultures in that it portrays the God of Israel as independent of creation and unthreatened by its potential destruction. Because most of the Hebrew Bible concerns the God of Israel's relationship with his people, most of the events described in it take place on earth, not in heaven. The Deuteronomistic source, Deuteronomistic history, and priestly source all portray the Temple in Jerusalem as the sole channel of communication between earth and heaven. Topic: Second Temple Judaism. During the period of the Second Temple, c. 515 BC to 70 AD, the Hebrew people lived under the rule of first the Persian Achaemenid Empire, then the Greek kingdoms of the Diadochi, and finally the Roman Empire. Their culture was profoundly influenced by those of the peoples who ruled them. Consequently, their views on existence after death were profoundly shaped by the ideas of the Persians, Greeks, and Romans. The idea of the immortality of the soul is derived from Greek philosophy and the idea of the resurrection of the dead is derived from Persian cosmology. By the early 1st century AD, these two seemingly incompatible ideas were often conflated by Hebrew thinkers. The Hebrews also inherited from the Persians, Greeks, and Romans the idea that the human soul originates in the divine realm and seeks to return there. The idea that a human soul belongs in heaven and that the earth is merely a temporary abode in which the soul is tested to prove its worthiness became increasingly popular during the Hellenistic period BC. Gradually, some Hebrews began to adopt the idea of heaven as the eternal home of the righteous dead. Topic. New Testament and early Christianity Descriptions of heaven in the New Testament are more fully developed than those in the Old Testament, but are still generally vague. As in the Old Testament, in the New Testament God is described as the ruler of heaven and earth, but his power over the earth is challenged by Satan. Sayings of Jesus recorded in the Gospels of Mark and Luke speak of the kingdom of God. Greek, Basilia to Theo, Basilia to Theo, while the Gospel of Matthew more commonly uses the term, Kingdom of Heaven. Greek, Basilia ton oranon, Basilia ton oranon. Both phrases have exactly the same meaning, but the author of the Gospel of Matthew changed the name, Kingdom of God, to Kingdom of Heaven, in most instances because it was the more acceptable phrase in his own cultural and religious context in the late 1st century. Modern scholars agree that the Kingdom of God was an essential part of the teachings of the historical Jesus. In spite of this, none of the Gospels ever record Jesus as having explained exactly what the phrase, "'Kingdom of God' means. The most likely explanation for this apparent omission is that the Kingdom of God was a commonly understood concept that required no explanation. Jews in Judea during the early first century believed that God reigns eternally in heaven, but many also believed that God would eventually establish his kingdom on earth as well. This belief is referenced in the first petition of the Lord's Prayer, taught by Jesus to his disciples and recorded in both Matthew chapter 6 verse 10 and Luke chapter 11 verse 2, "...your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven." Because God's kingdom was believed to be superior to any human kingdom, this meant that God would necessarily drive out the Romans, who ruled Judea, and establish his own direct rule over the Jewish people. In the teachings of the historical Jesus, people are expected to prepare for the coming of the kingdom of God by living moral lives. Jesus' commands for his followers to adopt lifestyles of moral perfectionism are found in many passages throughout the Synoptic Gospels, particularly in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5–7. Jesus also taught that, in the kingdom of heaven, there would be a reversal of roles in which, "...the last will be first and the first will be last." 
Mark chapter 10 verse 31, Matthew chapter 19 verse 30, Matthew chapter 20 verse 16, and Luke chapter 13 verse 30. This teaching recurs throughout the recorded teachings of Jesus, including in the admonition to be like a child in Mark chapter 10 verses 13 to 16, Matthew chapter 19 verse 30, and Luke chapter 18 verses 15 to 17. The parable of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter 16 verses 19 to 31. The parable of the workers in the vineyard in Matthew chapter 20 verses 1 to 16. The parable of the great banquet in Matthew chapter 22 verses 1 to 10, and the parable of the prodigal son in. Luke chapter 15 verses 11 to 32. Traditionally, Christianity has taught that heaven is the location of the throne of God as well as the holy angels, although this is in varying degrees considered metaphorical. In traditional Christianity, it is considered a state or condition of existence rather than a particular place somewhere in the cosmos of the supreme fulfillment of theosis in the beatific vision of the Godhead. In most forms of Christianity, heaven is also understood as the abode for the redeemed dead in the afterlife, usually a temporary stage before the resurrection of the dead and the saints return to the new earth. The resurrected Jesus is said to have ascended to heaven where he now sits at the right hand of God and will return to earth in the second coming. Various people have been said to have entered heaven while still alive, including Enoch, Elijah and Jesus himself, after his resurrection. According to Roman Catholic teaching, Mary, mother of Jesus, is also said to have been assumed into heaven and is titled the Queen of Heaven. In the 2nd century AD, Ioneus of Lyons recorded a belief that, in accordance with John 14 verse 2, those who in the afterlife see the Saviour are in different mansions, some dwelling in the heavens, others in paradise and others in the city. While the word used in all these writings, in particular the New Testament Greek word uranos, uranos, applies primarily to the sky, it is also used metaphorically of the dwelling place of God and the blessed. Similarly, though the English word, heaven, still keeps its original physical meaning when used, for instance, in allusions to the stars as, lights shining through from heaven. And in phrases such as heavenly body to mean an astronomical object, the heaven or happiness that Christianity looks forward to is, according to Pope John Paul II, neither an abstraction nor a physical place in the clouds, but a living, personal relationship with the Holy Trinity. It is our meeting with the Father which takes place in the risen Christ through the communion of the Holy Spirit. Topic: <laughs> Rabbinical Judaism. While the concept of heaven the kingdom of heaven is much discussed in Christian thought, the Jewish concept of the afterlife, sometimes known as Olam Haba, the world to come, is not discussed so often. The Torah has little to say on the subject of survival after death, but by the time of the rabbis two ideas had made inroads among the Jews, one, which is probably derived from Greek thought, is that of the immortal soul which returns to its creator after death, the other, which is thought to be of Persian origin, is that of resurrection of the dead. Jewish writings refer to a new earth as the abode of mankind following the resurrection of the dead. Originally, the two ideas of immortality and resurrection were different but in rabbinic thought they are combined, the soul departs from the body at death but is returned to it at the resurrection. This idea is linked to another rabbinic teaching, that men's good and bad actions are rewarded and punished not in this life but after death, whether immediately or at the subsequent resurrection. Around 1 CE, the Pharisees are said to have maintained belief in resurrection but the Sadducees are said to have denied it Matt. The Mishnah has many sayings about the world to come, for example, Rabbi Yaakov said, This world is like a lobby before the world to come, prepare yourself in the lobby so that you may enter the banquet hall. Judaism holds that the righteous of all nations have a share in the world to come. According to Nicholas de Lange, Judaism offers no clear teaching about the destiny which lies in wait for the individual after death, and its attitude to life after death has been expressed as follows. For the future is inscrutable, and the accepted sources of knowledge, whether experience, or reason, or revelation, offer no clear guidance about what is to come. The only certainty is that each man must die, beyond that we can only guess." According to Tracy R. Rich of the website, "...Judaism 101", 
Judaism, unlike other world religions, is not focused on the quest of getting into heaven but on life and how to live it. Topic: <laughs> Kabbalah Jewish Mysticism. In order from lowest to highest, the seven heavens, Shamayim, Samayim according to the Talmud, are listed alongside the angels who govern them. Balon, while one or Arafal, the first heaven, governed by Archangel Gabriel, is the closest of heavenly realms to the earth, it is also considered the abode of Adam and Eve. Rachi, Rachi of the second heaven is duly controlled by Zechariel and Raphael. It was in this heaven that Moses, during his visit to Paradise, encountered the angel Nuriel who stood, 300 parasangs high, with a retinue of 50 myriads of angels all fashioned out of water and fire. Also, Rachir is considered the realm where the fallen angels are imprisoned and the planets fastened. Shehakim, Sahakim Shechakim, the third heaven, under the leadership of Anahel, serves as the home of the Garden of Eden and the Tree of Life. It is also the realm where manna, the holy food of angels, is produced. The second book of Enoch, meanwhile, states that both paradise and hell are accommodated in Shehakim with hell being located simply on the northern side. Maun, me and the fourth heaven is ruled by the archangel Michael, and according to Talmud Haggiga 12, it contains the heavenly Jerusalem, the temple, and the altar. Makan, Mikan Makon, the fifth heaven is under the administration of Samael. It is also where the Isham and the song uttering choirs reside. Zebel, Zibel the sixth heaven falls under the jurisdiction of Sakiel. Araboth, Arabut Araboth, the seventh heaven, under the leadership of Cassiel, is the holiest of the seven heavens because it houses the throne of glory attended by the seven archangels and serves as the realm in which God dwells. Underneath the throne itself lies the abode of all unborn human souls. It is also considered the home of the seraphim, the cherubim, and the Topic: <laughs> Jewish Islam Similar to Jewish traditions such as the Talmud, the Quran and Hadith frequently mention the existence of seven Samawat, Smawat the plural of Sam, Sma meaning heaven, sky, celestial sphere, and cognate with Hebrew Shamayim. Some of the verses in the Quran mentioning the Samawat are Quran 41-12, Quran 65-12, Quran 71-15. Sidrat al-Muntaha, a large enigmatic lot tree, marks the end of the seventh heaven and the utmost extremity for all of God's creatures and heavenly knowledge. One interpretation of heavens is that all the stars and galaxies, including the Milky Way, are all part of the first heaven, and beyond that six still bigger worlds are there, which have yet to be discovered by scientists. According to Shiite sources, Ali mentioned the names of the seven heavens as below. Rafi, fee the least heaven. Smaulnya Kaidam, Kaidam Maram, Maram Afalun, Aflan Hayan, Haun Aris, Ruse Jma. Jma still an afterlife destination of the righteous is conceived in Islam as Janna Arabic, Garden of Eden, translated as Paradise. Regarding Eden or Paradise, the Quran says. The parable of the garden which the righteous are promised, beneath it flow rivers, perpetual is the fruits thereof and the shade therein. Such is the end of the righteous, and the end of the unbelievers is the hellfire." Quran 13.35 Islam rejects the concept of original sin, and Muslims believe that all human beings are born pure. Children automatically go to paradise when they die, regardless of the religion of their parents. Paradise is described primarily in physical terms as a place where every wish is immediately fulfilled when asked. Islamic texts describe a mortal life in Jannah as happy, without negative emotions. Those who dwell in Jannah are said to wear costly apparel, partake in exquisite banquets, and recline on couches inlaid with gold or precious stones. Inhabitants will rejoice in the company of their parents, spouses, and children. In Islam if one's good deeds outweigh one's sins then one may gain entrance to paradise. Conversely, if one's sins outweigh their good deeds they are sent to hell. The more good deeds one has performed the higher the level of jannah one is directed to. 
Verses which describe paradise include, Quran 1335, Quran 1831, Quran 38–49–54, Quran 35–33–35, Quran 52–17–27. The Quran refer to Jannah with different names: Al Firdaus, Jannatu (ADN), Garden of Eden, or Everlasting Gardens, Jannatu n Naim, Garden of Delight, Jannatu El Mawa, Garden of Refuge, Daru es Salam, Abode of Peace, Daru El Mukama, Abode of Permanent Stay, Al Mukamu El Amin, The Secure Station, and Jannatu El Qud. Garden of Immortality. In the Hadiths, these are the different regions in Paradise. Topic: <inaudible> Amadiya. <inaudible> According to the Amadiya view, much of the imagery presented in the Quran regarding heaven, but also hell, is in fact metaphorical. They propound the verse which describes, according to them, how the life to come after death is very different from the life here on earth. The Quran says, "...from bringing in your place others like you, and from developing you into a form which at present you know not." Quran 56-62. According to Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, the founder of Ahmadiyya sect in Islam, the soul will give birth to another rarer entity and will resemble the life on this earth in the sense that this entity will bear a similar relationship to the soul, as the soul bears relationship with the human existence on earth. On earth, if a person leads a righteous life and submits to the will of God, his or her tastes become attuned to enjoying spiritual pleasures as opposed to carnal desires. With this, an embryonic soul begins to take shape. Different tastes are said to be born which a person given to carnal passions finds no enjoyment. For example, sacrifice of one's own rights over that of others becomes enjoyable, or that forgiveness becomes second nature. In such a state a person finds contentment and peace at heart and at this stage, according to Ahmadiyya beliefs, it can be said that a soul within the soul has begun to take shape. <laughs> Bihari faith The Bihari faith regards the conventional description of heaven and hell as a specific place as symbolic. The Bihari writings describe heaven as a spiritual condition", where closeness to God is defined as heaven, conversely hell is seen as a state of remoteness from God. Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Bihari faith, has stated that the nature of the life of the soul in the afterlife is beyond comprehension in the physical plane, but has stated that the soul will retain its consciousness and individuality and remember its physical life, the soul will be able to recognize other souls and communicate with them. For Bihari's, entry into the next life has the potential to bring great joy. Baha'u'llah likened death to the process of birth. He explains. The world beyond is as different from this world as this world is different from that of the child while still in the womb of its mother." The analogy to the womb in many ways summarizes the Bihari view of earthly existence, just as the womb constitutes an important place for a person's initial physical development, the physical world provides for the development of the individual soul. Accordingly, Bihari's view life as a preparatory stage, where one can develop and perfect those qualities which will be needed in the next life. The key to spiritual progress is to follow the path outlined by the current manifestation of God, which Baha'is believe is currently Baha'u'llah. Baha'u'llah wrote, "...know thou, of a truth, that if the soul of man hath walked in the ways of God, it will, assuredly return and be gathered to the glory of the Beloved." The Bihari teachings state that there exists a hierarchy of souls in the afterlife, where the merits of each soul determines their place in the hierarchy, and that souls lower in the hierarchy cannot completely understand the station of those above. Each soul can continue to progress in the afterlife, but the soul's development is not entirely dependent on its own conscious efforts, the nature of which we are not aware, but also augmented by the grace of God, the prayers of others, and good deeds performed by others on earth in the name of that person. Chinese religions In the native Chinese Confucian traditions, heaven Qian, is an important concept, where the ancestors reside and from which emperors drew their mandate to rule in their dynastic propaganda, for example. 
Heaven is a key concept in Chinese mythology, philosophies and religions, and is on one end of the spectrum a synonym of Shangdi, supreme deity, and on the other naturalistic end, a synonym for nature and the sky. The Chinese term for heaven, Qian, Qian derives from the name of the supreme deity of the Zhou dynasty. After their conquest of the Shang dynasty in 1122 BC, the Zhou people considered their supreme deity Qian to be identical with the Shang supreme deity Shangdi. The Zhou people attributed heaven with anthropomorphic attributes, evidenced in the etymology of the Chinese character for heaven or sky, which originally depicted a person with a large cranium. Heaven is said to see, hear, and watch over all men. Heaven is affected by man's doings, and having personality, is happy and angry with them. Heaven blesses those who please it and sends calamities upon those who offend it. Heaven was also believed to transcend all other spirits and gods, with Confucius asserting, "...he who offends against heaven has none to whom he can pray." Other philosophers born around the time of Confucius such as Mozi took an even more theistic view of heaven, believing that heaven is the divine ruler, just as the son of heaven the king of Zhou, is the earthly ruler. Mozi believed that spirits and minor gods exist, but their function is merely to carry out the will of heaven, watching for evil doers and punishing them. Thus they function as angels of heaven and do not detract from its monotheistic government of the world. With such a high monotheism, it is not surprising that Mahism championed a concept called universal love, GRI, GRI which taught that heaven loves all people equally and that each person should similarly love all human beings without distinguishing between his own relatives and those of others. In Mozi's Will of Heaven, Qian Zhi he writes, Mozi criticized the Confucians of his own time for not following the teachings of Confucius. By the time of the later Han dynasty, however, under the influence of Zunzi, the Chinese concept of heaven and Confucianism itself had become mostly naturalistic, though some Confucians argued that heaven was where ancestors reside. Worship of heaven in China continued with the erection of shrines, the last and greatest being the Temple of Heaven in Beijing, and the offering of prayers. The ruler of China in every Chinese dynasty would perform annual sacrificial rituals to heaven, usually by slaughtering two healthy bulls as a sacrifice. Topic: <inaudible> Indic religions. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Buddhism. In Buddhism there are several heavens, all of which are still part of samsara illusionary reality. Those who accumulate good karma may be reborn in one of them. However, their stay in heaven is not eternal. Eventually they will use up their good karma and will undergo rebirth into another realm, as a human, animal or other being. Because heaven is temporary and part of samsara, Buddhists focus more on escaping the cycle of rebirth and reaching enlightenment nirvana. Nirvana is not a heaven but a mental state. According to Buddhist cosmology the universe is impermanent and beings transmigrate through a number of existential planes, in which this human world is only one realm or path. These are traditionally envisioned as a vertical continuum with the heavens existing above the human realm, and the realms of the animals, hungry ghosts and hell beings existing beneath it. According to Jan Chosen Bays in her book, Jizo, Guardian of Children, Travelers, and Other Voyages, the realm of the Asura is a later refinement of the heavenly realm and was inserted between the human realm and the heavens. One important Buddhist heaven is the Traestrimsa, which resembles Olympus of Greek mythology. In the Mahayana worldview, there are also pure lands which lie outside this continuum and are created by the Buddhas upon attaining enlightenment. Rebirth in the pure land of Amitabha is seen as an assurance of Buddhahood, for once reborn there, beings do not fall back into cyclical existence unless they choose to do so to save other beings, the goal of Buddhism being the obtainment of enlightenment and freeing oneself and others from the birth-death cycle. The Tibetan word bardo means literally, intermediate state. In Sanskrit the concept has the name Antarabhava. Topic. According to Anguttara Nikaya Brahma Loka Here the denizens are Brahmas, and the ruler is Mahabrahma 
After developing the four Brahmaviharas, King Makadeva rebirths here after death. The monk Tissa and Brahmana Janasoni were also reborn here. For a monk, the next best thing to nirvana is to be reborn in this Brahmaloka. The lifespan of a Brahmas is not stated but is not eternal. Parinyamita Vasavadan or Parinyamita Vasavadi The heaven of devas, with power over others creations. These devas do not create pleasing forms that they desire for themselves, but their desires are fulfilled by the acts of other devas who wish for their favor. The ruler of this world is called Vasavadan, Pali, Vasavati, who has longer life, greater beauty, more power and happiness and more delightful sense objects than the other devas of his world. This world is also the home of the Devaputra, being a divine race, called Mara, who endeavors to keep all beings of the Kamadatu in the grip of sensual pleasures. Mara is also sometimes called Vasavadan, but in general these two dwellers in this world are kept distinct. The beings of this world are 4,500 feet 1, meters tall and live for 9,216,000,000 years Sarvastivada tradition. Nimanarati The world of devas. Delighting in their creations. The devas of this world are capable of making any appearance to please themselves. The lord of this world is called Sunyamita, Pali Sunyamita, his wife is the rebirth of Visaka, formerly the chief Upasika, female lay devotee, of the Buddha. The beings of this world are 3,750 feet 1, meters tall and live for 2,304,000,000 years, Sarvastivada tradition. Tuzita The world of the joyful devas. This world is best known for being the world in which a bodhisattva lives before being reborn in the world of humans. Until a few thousand years ago, the bodhisattva of this world was Svetaketu Pali, Setaketu, who was reborn as Siddhartha, who would become the Buddha Sakyamuni, since then the bodhisattva has been Natha or Nathadeva, who will be reborn as Ahita and will become the Buddha Maitreya Pali Metaya. While this bodhisattva is the foremost of the dwellers in Tuzita, the ruler of this world is another deva called Santuzita Pali, Santuzita. The beings of this world are 3,000 feet 910 meters tall and live for 576 million years Sarvastivada tradition. Anathapandika, a Kosalan householder and benefactor to the Buddha's order was reborn here. Yama the denizens here have a lifespan of 144 million years. Tavatimsa The ruler of this heaven is Indra or Chakra, and the realm is also called Trayatrimya. Each denizen addresses other denizens as the title, Marissa. The governing hall of this heaven is called Sudhammer Hall. This heaven has a garden Nandanavana with damsels, as its most magnificent site. Ahita the Lichavi army general was reborn here. Gopika the Sakyan girl was reborn as a male god in this realm. Any Buddhist reborn in this realm can outshine any of the previously dwelling denizens because of the extra merit acquired for following the Buddha's teachings. The denizens here have a lifespan of 36 million years. Katamaharajika The heaven of the four great kings. Its rulers are the four great kings of the name, Virudaka Virudaka, Dirtarastra Dirtarastra, Virupaksa Virupaksa, and their leader Vaisravana Vaisyavana. The devas who guide the sun and moon are also considered part of this world, as are the retinues of the four kings, composed of Kumbhandas Kumbhanda dwarfs, Gandhava Gandhava s fairies, Nagas snakes, and Yaksas Yaksa goblins. The beings of this world are 750 feet 230 meters tall and live for 9 million years Sarvastivada tradition or 90,000 years Vibhajavada tradition. <laughs> Tibetan Buddhism There are five major types of heavens. Akanishtha or Garnaviya this is the most supreme heaven wherein beings that have achieved nirvana live for eternity. Heaven of the Jinas Heavens of formless spirits these are four in number. Brahmaloka these are sixteen in number, and are free from sensuality. Devaloka these are six in number, and contain sensuality. Topic. 
According to the Shurongama Sutra, The Six Desire Heaven The cause for birth in the Six Desire Heavens are the Ten Good Conducts.1. The Heaven of the Four Kings Those with no interest in deviant sexual activity and so develop a purity and produce light. When their life ends, they draw near the sun and moon and are among those born in the Heaven of the Four Kings. Master Ao Yi Jiksu explains that the Shurongama Sutra only emphasized on avoiding deviant sexual desire, but one would naturally also need to avoid killing and abide by the ten good conducts to be born in this heaven. 2. The Trayastrimsha Heaven Those whose sexual love for their wives is slight, but who have not yet obtained the entire flavor of dwelling in purity, transcend the light of sun and moon at the end of their lives, and reside at the summit of the human realm. They are among those born in the Trayastrimsha heaven. 3. The Suyama heaven. Those who become temporarily involved when they meet with desire but who forget about it when it is finished, and who, while in the human realm, are active less and quiet more, abide at the end of their lives in light and emptiness where the illumination of sun and moon does not reach. These beings have their own light, and they are among those born in the Suyama heaven. 4. The Tushita Heaven Those who are quiet all the time, but who are not yet able to resist when stimulated by contact, ascend at the end of their lives to a subtle and ethereal place, they will not be drawn into the lower realms. The destruction of the realms of humans and gods and the obliteration of Kalpas by the three disasters will not reach them, for they are among those born in the Tushita Heaven. 5. The Heaven of Bliss by Transformation those who are devoid of desire, but who will engage in it for the sake of their partner, even though the flavor of doing so is like the flavor of chewing wax, are born at the end of their lives in a place of transcending transformations. They are among those born in the heaven of bliss by transformation. 6. The heaven of the comfort from others' transformations those who have no kind of worldly thoughts while doing what worldly people do, who are lucid and beyond such activity while involved in it, are capable at the end of their lives of entirely transcending states where transformations may be present and may be lacking. They are among those born in the heaven of the comfort from others' transformations. The form realm The first jhana, the second jhana, the third jhana and the fourth jhana. The first jhana those who flow to these levels will not be oppressed by any suffering or affliction. Although they have not developed proper samadhi, their minds are pure to the point that they are not moved by outflows. 1. The heaven of the multitudes of Brahma Those in the world who cultivate their minds but do not avail themselves of jhana and so have no wisdom, can only control their bodies so as to not engage in sexual desire. Whether walking or sitting, or in their thoughts, they are totally devoid of it. Since they do not give rise to defiling love, they do not remain in the realm of desire. These people can, in response to their thought, take on the bodies of Brahma beings. They are among those in the heaven of the multitudes of Brahma. 2. The heaven of the ministers of Brahma. Those whose hearts of desire have already been cast aside, the mind apart from desire manifests. They have a fond regard for the rules of discipline and delight in being in accord with them. These people can practice the Brahma virtue at all times, and they are among those in the heaven of the ministers of Brahma. 3. The great Brahma heaven Those whose bodies and minds are wonderfully perfect, and whose awesome deportment is not in the least deficient, are pure in the prohibitive precepts and have a thorough understanding of them as well. At all times these people can govern the Brahma multitudes as great Brahma lords, and they are among those in the great Brahma heaven. The second jhana Those who flow to these levels will not be oppressed by worries or vexations. Although they have not developed proper samadhi, their minds are pure to the point that they have subdued their coarser outflows. 1. The heaven of lesser light those beyond the Brahma heavens gather in and govern the Brahma beings, for their Brahma conduct is perfect and fulfilled. Unmoving and with settled minds, they produce light in profound stillness, and they are among those in the heaven of lesser light. 2. The heaven of limitless light 
Those whose lights illumine each other in an endless dazzling blaze shine throughout the realms of the ten directions so that everything becomes like crystal. They are among those in the heaven of limitless light. 3. The light sound heaven. Those who take in and hold the light to perfection accomplish the substance of the teaching. Creating and transforming the purity into endless responses and functions, they are among those in the light sound heaven. The third jhana 1. The heaven of lesser purity The heavenly beings for whom the perfection of light has become sound and who further open out the sound to disclose its wonder discover a subtler level of practice. They penetrate to the bliss of still extinction and are among those in the heaven of lesser purity. 2. The heaven of limitless purity. Those in whom the emptiness of purity manifests are led to discover its boundlessness. Their bodies and minds experience light ease, and they accomplish the bliss of still extinction. They are among those in the heaven of limitless purity. 3. The heaven of pervasive purity. Those for whom the world, the body, and the mind are all perfectly pure have accomplished the virtue of purity, and a superior level emerges. They return to the bliss of still extinction, and they are among those in the heaven of pervasive purity. <inaudible> Hinduism Attaining heaven is not the final pursuit in Hinduism as heaven itself is ephemeral and related to physical body. Only being tied by the Bhut Tattvas, heaven cannot be perfect either and is just another name for pleasurable and mundane material life. According to Hindu cosmology, above the earthly plane, are other planes, one, Uvaloka, two, Swagaloka, meaning good kingdom, is the general name for heaven in Hinduism, a heavenly paradise of pleasure, where most of the Hindu devadas deva, reside along with the king of devas, Indra, and beatified mortals. Some other planes are Mahaloka, Yanaloka, Tapaloka and Sajaloka. Since heavenly abodes are also tied to the cycle of birth and death, any dweller of heaven or hell will again be recycled to a different plane and in a different form per the karma and maya, i.e. the illusion of samsara. This cycle is broken only by self-realization by the jivatma. This self-realization is moksha tariya, kaivalya. The concept of moksha is unique to Hinduism and is unparalleled. Moksha stands for liberation from the cycle of birth and death and final communion with Brahman. With Moksha, a liberated soul attains the stature and oneness with Brahman or Paramatma. Different schools such as Vedanta, Mimansa, Sankhya, Nyaya, Vaisheshika, and Yoga offer subtle differences in the concept of Brahman, obvious universe, its genesis and regular destruction, Jivatma, nature prakriti, and also the right way in attaining perfect bliss or Moksha. In the Vaishnava traditions the highest heaven is Vaikantha, which exists above the six heavenly lokas and outside of the Mahat Tattva or mundane world. It's where eternally liberated souls who have attained moksha reside in eternal sublime beauty with Lakshmi and Narayana a manifestation of Vishnu. In the Nasadiya Sukta, the heavens, sky Vyaman is mentioned as a place from which an overseeing entity surveys what has been created. However, the Nasadiya Sukta questions the omniscience of this overseer. <inaudible> Jainism The shape of the universe as described in Jainism is shown alongside. Unlike the current convention of using north direction as the top of map, this uses south as the top. The shape is similar to a part of human form standing upright. The Deva Loka heavens are at the symbolic chest, where all souls enjoying the positive karmic effects reside. The heavenly beings are referred to as Devas masculine form and Devis feminine form. According to Jainism, there is not one heavenly abode, but several layers to reward appropriately the souls a varying degree of karmic merits. Similarly, beneath the waste are the Naka Loka hell. Human, animal, insect, plant and microscopic life forms reside on the middle. The pure souls who reached Siddha status reside at the very south end top of the universe. They are referred to in Tamil literature as Tenpalata Kural 43. Topic: 
Topic: <laughs> Sikh religion. As per Sikh thought, heaven and hell are not places for living hereafter. They are part of spiritual topography of man and do not exist otherwise. They refer to good and evil stages of life respectively and can be lived now and here during our earthly existence. For example, Bhagat Kabir rejects the otherworldly heaven in Guru Granth Sahib and says that one can experience heaven on this earth by doing company of holy people. <laughs> Mesoamerican religions The Nahua people such as the Aztecs, Chichimecs and the Toltecs believed that the heavens were constructed and separated into thirteen levels. Each level had from one to many lords living in and ruling these heavens. Most important of these heavens was Omeyokan, Placer II. The thirteen heavens were ruled by Omidyatl, the Jewel Lord, creator of the Jewel Genesis who, as male, takes the name Omidyatl, Two Lord, and as female is named Omesawathal, Two Lady. Polynesia In the creation myths of Polynesian mythology are found various concepts of the heavens and the underworld. These differ from one island to another. What they share is the view of the universe as an egg or coconut that is divided between the world of humans Earth, the upper world of heavenly gods, and the underworld. Each of these is subdivided in a manner reminiscent of Dante's Divine Comedy, but the number of divisions and their names differs from one Polynesian culture to another. Maori In Maori mythology, the heavens are divided into a number of realms. Different tribes number the heaven differently, with as few as two and as many as fourteen levels. One of the more common versions divides heaven thus Kiko Rangi, presided over by the gods Tumai Wakamaru, the heaven of sunshine and rain Narodo, the heaven of lakes where the god Maru rules Haora, where the spirits of newborn children originate Nataira, home of the servant gods Naratua, which is ruled over by the hero Tafaki Autoya, where human souls are created Aukumea, where spirits live Wairua, where spirit gods live while waiting on those in Naharangi or Chuwere, where the great gods live presided over by Rehmuth Maori believe these heavens are supported by pillars. Other Polynesian peoples see them being supported by gods as in Hawaii. In one Tahitian legend, heaven is supported by an octopus. Topic: Paumotu, Tuamotus. The Polynesian conception of the universe and its division is nicely illustrated by a famous drawing made by a Tuamotuan chief in 1869. Here, the nine heavens are further divided into left and right, and each stage is associated with a stage in the evolution of the Earth that is portrayed below. The lowest division represents a period when the heavens hung low over the earth, which was inhabited by animals that were not known to the islanders. In the third division is shown the first murder, the first burials, and the first canoes, built by Rada. In the fourth division, the first coconut tree and other significant plants are born. Theosophy. It is believed in Theosophy of Helena Blavatsky that each religion including Theosophy, has its own individual heaven in various regions of the upper astral plane that fits the description of that heaven that is given in each religion, which a soul that has been good in their previous life on Earth will go to. The area of the upper astral plane of Earth in the upper atmosphere where the various heavens are located is called Summerland. Theosophists believe Hell is located in the lower astral plane of Earth which extends downward from the surface of the Earth down to its center. However, Theosophists believe that the soul is recalled back to Earth after an average of about 1,400 years by the Lords of Karma to incarnate again. The final heaven that souls go to billions of years in the future after they finish their cycle of incarnations is called Devachan. Topic: 
Topic: <laughs> Criticism of the belief in heaven. Anarchist Emma Goldman expressed this view when she wrote, "...consciously or unconsciously, most theists see in gods and devils, heaven and hell, reward and punishment, a whip to lash the people into obedience, meekness and contentment." Many people consider George Orwell's use of Sugarcandy Mountain in his novel Animal Farm to be a literary expression of this view. In the book, the animals were told that after their miserable lives were over they would go to a place in which it was Sunday seven days a week, clover was in season all the year round, and lump sugar and linseed cake grew on the hedges." Some have argued that a belief in a reward after death is poor motivation for moral behavior while alive. Sam Harris wrote, it is rather more noble to help people purely out of concern for their suffering than it is to help them because you think the creator of the universe wants you to do it, or will reward you for doing it, or will punish you for not doing it. The problem with this linkage between religion and morality is that it gives people bad reasons to help other human beings when good reasons are available. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Neuroscience. In Inside the Neolithic Mind, Lewis Williams and Pierce argue that a tiered structure of heaven, along with similarly structured circles of hell, is neurally perceived by members of many cultures around the world and through history. The reports are so similar across time and space that Lewis Williams and Pierce argue for a neuroscientific explanation, accepting the percepts as real neural activations and subjective percepts during particular altered states of consciousness. Many people who come close to death and have near-death experiences report meeting relatives or entering the light in an otherworldly dimension, which share similarities with the religious concept of heaven. Even though there are also reports of distressing experiences and negative life reviews, which share some similarities with the concept of hell, the positive experiences of meeting or entering the light is reported as an immensely intense feeling state of love, peace and joy beyond human comprehension. Together with this intensely positive feeling state, people who have near-death experiences also report that consciousness or a heightened state of awareness seems as if it is at the heart of experiencing a taste of heaven. <laughs> Postmodern views <laughs> Representations in arts Works of fiction have included numerous different conceptions of heaven and hell. The two most famous descriptions of heaven are given in Dante Alighieri's Paradiso of the Divine Comedy and John Milton's Paradise Lost. Topic: See also. Baptism. Beatification. Death. God. Hell Indulgence Paradise Penance Purgatory Redemption Saint Salvation Servant of God Venerable <inaudible>